Hi everyone. This week we spoke to the author and journalist Ronnie Reng about his moving book, A Life Too Short, The Tragedy of Robert Enker. The book deals with the suicide of the Germany national goalkeeper Robert Enker in an incredibly compassionate and well-researched way. Just a warning, that the episode discusses Hi, Ronnie, how are you? So oh, maybe oh, thanks, uh, very fine people. indeed, yeah, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the interview. Um, so to start with, could you just talk a little bit about um, about Robert Enker and, and, and your relationship with him and why you wanted to, to write the book about him? Um, well, I didn't really want to write the book uh, for a start because um, of Robert uh, Enker, who was a German goalkeeper, playing for the national team and for clubs like Barcelona, the biggest in the world, um, uh, on the um, in November two thousand and nine, he he took his own life um, due to depression. And um, I was I was quite close to him. I wouldn't call myself a friend. I think a friend is something deeper. But um, let's say I was a a football friend, or we you know I was working as a journalist, as a writer uh, in in football, and I had written about him many times, and I got to know him quite well. Um, so when he when he took his own life, I was taken aback. Back, I was uh, shocked, and uh, writing a book book was basically the last thing on my on my mind. It was more that um, his wife Teresa and uh, his two closest friends they they asked me to write the book so that something of him would remain, and that maybe people um, would understand his story and maybe would understand depression, the illness, a little bit better. Well, that's um, how I came to write this book. Yeah, and I think that's something that you do incredibly well in in the book is is you write very compassionately about about the issues that Robert was suffering with. Um, so was it? I suppose we kind of see elite sportsmen as kind of invincible and um, and kind of untouchable and and, um, and have a kind of very thick armor. So was were these issues kind of present throughout Robert's life, or did they kind of start? once the the pressure of elite sport kind of ratcheted up as he moved up up the levels i think we have to be careful to to draw um a relationship or between him being a sportsman a top sportsman and the depression um because from what i learned um doing the research for the book i think there's a great great chance even if chance is the wrong word uh, that robert would have um caught a, a bout of depression, um, even if he would have been a journalist or, or a baker or a banker or something. I think um, he was prone to, to depression um, for whatever reasons, by genetic or by trauma in his youth, I don't know. Um, and it happened that he was an elite sportsman and uh, who, who got the depression. So I think it shows us that um, everybody is vulnerable to that illness. Um, I think um, statistics says that one in 10 people in, in, in our world uh, will, will be caught by depression uh, once or even more in, in life. And so it's quite logic that, that even sportsmen uh, who can cope with pressure, who are mentally strong um, when, they're, when they are not ill, the moments when they're healthy, that even they um, are in danger or vulnerable to, to depression. Yeah, I think that's a really important distinction to make that, you know, someone like a professional goalkeeper has to be so mentally strong and so concentrated in, 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 in that part of the job and still um, and, and still something like depression just doesn't discriminate from that. Yeah. Um, I think um, we have to stress that the people suffering from depression are many times uh, very, very strong, mentally strong people like, like Robert. Um, as I said, when he was healthy, and he was healthy most of the time of his life, um, he was uh, especially mentally very, very strong. Um, people admired him for being so calm when he was standing goal for, for Germany, when he was keeping goal for Germany. Um, and he had in his whole life, um, which lasted sadly only 33 years, he had just uh, two big clinical depressions, um, which again lasted a few months. Well, the second one then actually killed him but i think that's that's also very important to stress that um, people suffering from depression like robert they are not um, some kind of freaks they're just people who at a certain time in life 
suffer from from an illness yeah i think what you say is is important that he he kind of had two bouts of of quite bad depression um can you can you explain a bit about where the first one was and the and the help that 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 he got to kind of um to get a little bit better and then and then where he was with the second one in his life and 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 what happened there the first time the depression really hit Robert were in 2003. Um, he was at Football Club Barcelona at the time, which is regarded as uh, maybe the biggest football team in the world, uh, with permission of Manchester United, probably. And um, he was very happy uh, when, when, when he signed for Barcelona. I remember meeting him in Barcelona and going to, to a cafe, sitting outside in the sun. And, um, and he said to me, literally i can't believe how happy i am um everything is just fine for me here um the sun is shining all the time on me um but after a few weeks um he realized that he wouldn't be he wouldn't make it as a number one goalkeeper for barcelona that the manager at the time preferred to play a young understudy called victor valdez and uh Robert was taken aback from that um, and he blamed himself. He said, I had the chance to, to play for Barcelona um, and I blew it. Um, it can't, he saw him training. He thought he was much better in training than Victor Valdez, but still the manager preferred this young kid. So Robert blamed himself. Um, I must have done something wrong. Maybe I didn't play well enough. Um, didn't play the ball well enough from, from the back to my teammates. Uh, well, we, maybe with a feet I'm not strong enough to to pass the ball and I think he as I said he was uh, certainly prone to depression I think he became into into some kind of internal struggle uh, by blaming himself um, something too and then and he lost the the ability to see the world clearly and uh, to see it rationally um, and after a few weeks um, well, there was just darkness uh, in his thoughts. Um, this blame game of blaming himself had taken over completely. And he realized um, he was facing a severe bout of depression. Um, so I think if we, if we try to analyze that, um, in this case, I think we have a person who is uh, by genetics or by trauma in his use, as I said, we don't know, uh, is prone to depression. And um, then there is one, then it still needs an, an outbreak, you know, a reason for an outbreak, something which uh, kicks him over, over the edge at the time. And it seems that at that time, it was Robert uh, well, blaming himself and, and, and um, yeah, basically getting into that um, dark, dark thinking and not being able um, after a while to get out of it. And he had the... I think typical symptoms of somebody suffering from depression that he was trying, that he wanted to hide from the world, that um, he wanted to stay in the dark in the mornings. He found it very, very difficult to get up at bed, from bed, sorry. Um, he was trying to lock himself in at home. His wife was really trying to, to push him out because he knew, she knew when, um, if he would stay at home, he would just break down completely. Um, and we are talking 2003 at the time there were hardly any examples or i don't think there was an example of a sportsman uh, top sportsman doing sports doing his job with depression so the two of them his wife teresa and robert felt that um, basically they have to hide his illness and try to pretend if nothing was wrong and at the th same time there wasn't any professional helpline particularly for sportsmen um, in terms of mental health. So they were really um, trying to, to find out for themselves, left alone from the world, trying to find some help. And um, they found a German-speaking psychiatrist in Barce Barcelona, and Robert had treatment there. It didn't really work well, maybe because the depression was too deep, um, maybe because Robert at the same time was trying to to hide the depression and creating more pressure on himself so he 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 went on with that depression and didn't really get out of it and uh, 
at the end of the season, Barcelona asked him for a transfer because um, he hadn't hadn't um, fulfilled their expectations. He was just uh, the third choice goalkeeper at the time, and he went to to Fenerbahce Istanbul, and there the depression again kicked in really hard, and he realized himself, I can't go on like this, trying to hide the depression, trying to cure it by myself, basically. And um, he asked Fenerbahce to, to basically to rip uh, off the contract or to get out of the contract. And he searched professional help in, in Germany, uh, which he found in Cologne. And after, I think, a treatment for, for six weeks or something, um, he was healthy again. And then after that first bout of depression, that was maybe the time where I found himself the the most happiest I ever have seen him because I think because he had that feeling that he overcome the, the depre- had overcome the depression, that he was so happy to be alive again, um, to be able to feel again, that after that, that depression, he was, um, well, stronger than ever, I think. From, from my interpretation of, of, of the book, that's when he kind of started to play or it became a period where he started to play to play his best football. So did it, was it publicly known after after he he left Fenerbahce what he was going through or was it still still kept, kept um, not kept quiet because it's perfectly understandable for someone not to, not to want, um, to want people to know about these things, especially in the environment that, that he was in. But did they let people know? Did, did the potential new, new clubs know um, what he was been through, what he was going through? No, there was just an inner circle of friends who knew about it. And at the time, um, as I was trying to point out, um, I don't think sports at the time, professional sports was, sorry, I don't think professional sports at the time was prepared to deal with uh, somebody suffering from depression. Um, in Germany, for example, there was just one example of a, of a high profile player who had depression. And that was, in a sense, a negative example because um, Sebastian Deisler, another national team player, he retired from football because of his depression. So Robert felt, um, well, to suffer from depression and to play football on the highest level is not feasible. It's not something uh, people would allow you. There would be question asked, um, is that man too weak mentally to play in goal? So he was hiding it from from his clubs, from, from his managers, and there was only in 2009, when he was six years later, when he was hit a second time from a, a clinical depression, when he opened up to a few teammates he trusted because he felt he could deal better with the situation if there was some, at least somebody um, at the club he could trust and let in. Yeah, it strikes me as it's kind of slightly ironic that that potentially football clubs or, or media or, or whatever would um, would see someone talking about these issues as uh, as a weakness in their in their character when actually um, if you read the book and you see what what Robert went through and actually how he brought himself back to kind of playing the best football of his life that actually that's an incredible strength that shows incredible mental strength so it, it, there's no way it could have been been a weakness but I wonder if you think the the perception of something like that has, has changed in football since then. Most certainly, yes. I think there was just a, a lack of, of, of knowledge about mental illnesses at the time. Um, and I can take myself as a prime example. I didn't know anything about depressions. And uh, in 2003, with Robert's first clinical depression, um, at the time I was living in Barcelona and I met him on a regular basis and I realized that he was very sad and I didn't link it to depression because I had no knowledge at all about it. I just thought, oh my God, how can he be so sad just because he's not playing at Barcelona um, football club? So I think people who have no knowledge about football, they see somebody suffering from depression and they make up any any kind of reasons for themselves why he should be that sad. Um, and like, I think in many, many ways of life, there always needs to be just something very sad or drastic to happen uh, until people understand. And sadly, it was Robert's death who 
who changed a lot um, in, in professional sports because um, people started to ask questions even themselves. Hold on, that was Robert Anke, one of the st mentally strongest goalkeepers we had in Germany. And he took his own life. Um, this must be a very strong illness. And we need to understand that illness if sportsmen, like any other people um, from any other ways of life, suffer from that illness. So there was quite a big eagerness or will, I think, in society and also in sports to, to learn about the illness, um, to accept that there is an illness, like, that there are mental, mental health issues or illnesses like there are physical illnesses, and uh, try to, to build up a better support line for these kind of sportsmen. And I think, at least in Germany these days, we have an excellent... Um, support line for sportsmen. We have a network of uh, sports psychiatrists who are specialized in sportsmen all over the country. And even if uh, managers or sports directors um, are not specialists on depression, they all have a vague feeling that this illness is happening um, to sportsmen like a crucial ligament injury. And so if a sportsman is prepared to, to search help for, for a mental issue, mental health issue he will certainly find some help these days yeah that's really good so during his kind of you mentioned there that during his second bout with the depression he was at Hanover and and that he kind of confided in a couple of teammates and and from reading the book that they were actually incredibly supportive and 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 um and really helped him so was that how many people in and around the club and in and around um, the German national team knew knew what was going on with Robert at that time? In the national team, nobody knew um, because he still felt um, if he would confide to somebody, that could be the end of his football career. Um, at his club at the time, Hanover, there was a particular one player called Hanno Balic, who was a close friend to Robert, but also came across to Robert as a very sensible and sensitive person. Robert confided in and there was uh, another person, the, um, the physiotherapist uh, at the club who Robert had a strong link with and, link with and uh, who seemed to Robert a person he could trust. And those were the two, two persons he, he trusted in. And um, I think it helped him a lot that there was some that he didn't feel alone at the time at the club um, and I also I think it took out a lot of uh, strength out of him um, that he was to had to play act all the time that he had to play the role of the strong uh, calm goalkeeper where whereas inside he was suffering from darkness and um, I think we can generalize that I think it's very important uh, when you suffer from depression uh, no matter if you're a top goalkeeper or if you're a baker or a journalist, it's very important that you have some people uh, where you have a feeling, mm, I don't have to play a role with them. Um, I can just show them how desperately I feel at the time. After Robert took his own life, what was, what was the reaction amongst, well, I suppose, even in, in the general kind of German media and, and uh, specifically within football. I remember in the UK it was actually reported um, quite widely and there was a lot of shock and um, even a bit of self-reflection about, you know, football as a sport and, and, and how we look at people in the game. Was, was it a similar thing in, in, in Germany? I would think so, yes. I think, first of all, there was the disbelief. Um, then came that kind of soul searching where everybody felt like, hold on, um, I myself treat the sportsmen as, uh, well, not human beings. I just see them as, um, well, a comic figure, basically, which we can uh, praise over the odds or, or um, throw, ab throw ad abuse at them over the odds. Um, um, and people realize, no, these are human beings with, uh, with fears, with problems, with illnesses like everybody else. So that was the second stage and I think the third stage and not everybody came to that th third stage, but some people was um, 
hold on, we need to understand that illness better. Um, we need to, to explain that illness better. Um, for example, we need to explain why does somebody who suffers from depression is in danger of killing himself because that uh, idea of or uh, that uh, su suicidal um, thought is part of the illness um, because your brain at the time the chemical the chemistry the chemistry of your brain at the time doesn't work properly and uh, you just want to get rid of this illness and because you got a distorted view of reality you got this crazy idea that uh, if I kill myself that's maybe the only way to get rid of my Ill of that illness so that was maybe the you know there were some people who were trying to to explain that and well as well and to to educate society a bit yeah so w one thing that really struck me in the book is how compassionately and uh, and how detailed you, you dealt with 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 mental illness was something was that something that that you personally had to learn to do or or had you um had you kind of knowledge of that subject area before no i had no experience in my in my surroundings at all from somebody suffering from depression and as i had no knowledge of depression i was maybe i was blind maybe to to people suffering from depression um it was something that when his wife Teresa and his two best friends asked me to write the book uh, at the beginning I was quite scared to write it but then I felt if I do write the book um, the only way to do it is basically to explain people um, the illness which killed Robert um, that must be the legacy of Robert that people maybe through his story understand better um, what goes on in the mind of somebody suffering from depression how depression work. So that was the, the big target basically for that book that I wanted to explain, uh, not scientifically, but um, well, in a way that everybody could relate to how depression works. And uh, in a way, I was lucky that I had Robert's diaries and that uh, in that diary, Robert described um, the, the train of thought which hit him during a depression, you know, the 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 inability to to see any positive signs in life um, these these uh, diaries really helped because um, I could just well quote Robert and he could explain in a way him, himself to the readers what what happened to him yeah yeah um, and, and you talk you talked a bit about the kind of legacy of, of, of Robert there and um, I think it was his wife and um, maybe with the involvement of the friends you were talking about, they set up the, the Robert Enke Foundation. Um, what, what does that look to do and, and what, how does that work? Well, one of the, the shocking experience of Robert and his wife at the time of illness was that they had the feeling they had nowhere to go to. Um, so his wife, Teresa, thought... Um, if there's just one good thing coming out of Robert's death, it must be that people suffering from depression or mental health issues um, find, find it easier to get help. So the main target of the Robert Enke Foundation really was to, first of all, set up a network of sports psychiatrists um, in, in Germany, I think we got now over 70 sports psychiatrists uh, working all over the country. Um, and well, we go to, I mean, I work for the foundation now as well. And I go with another um, former footballer, professional footballer, Martin Armadek, who played for Borussia Dortmund, um, who made it to the German Cup final with Dortmund and who suffered from depression during his career. Martin and me, we go to... Um, to the academies of the German football clubs and we, we teach uh, or we, we tell, we talk to young players, young trainee players about depression in a very, we hope in a very normal way. Um, so, that, so they can have at least an awareness that that mental illness exists and that um, if somebody suffers from it, it's not, um, it's something, well, just normal part of, part of life really. Um, so we do a lot of uh, yeah talk to to 
basically to normalize um, mental mental health issues. Yeah, I think that's really good that it's kind of a proactive step that that, that German clubs and, and the foundation is doing in academies rather than um, rather than leaving it until the player has an issue. They're they're tackling it um, right at the base, I suppose. Yeah, I think that's that's uh, there, there there are two two big parts of depression which needs to or the treatment of depression which needs to improve first of all is the awareness um, that these illness exist as I said um, until 20 years ago um, society wasn't really prepared to talk about it we were like with all difficult things we were trying to to push over them basically to we're trying to pretend not to see them I think talking to my parents for example 50 years ago they said to me it was quite difficult to talk about even about cancer. And obviously, and if you're not talking about things, um, it's much more difficult to treat these kind of illnesses. So I think that's the, the first step is always uh, normalizing, normalizing mental health issues, um, getting people to know about it, at least giving them awake knowledge about it. And then the second part, part of it, uh, getting proper treatment, is always much easier if there's a bigger knowledge. Yeah, and something we always kind of ask every guest is how they they look after their own mental well-being. And you say you've not had, uh, you know, personal experiences of, of depression, but you know everybody does have their own mental health, and it goes up and down, and it may not reach the the nadirs of, of depression, but it does go up and down. So how do you look after your own your own mental well-being? Well, uh, well, as I said, I wasn't aware of anything. Uh, that I wasn't aware that you should care about your mental health before um, I had to write Robert's story. And um, I don't do much different things than before, but I do them more uh, with a bigger awareness. Like I, I, I love running anyway. So I try to, to go running uh, four or five times a week, um, even if I'm much slower than I was in the... In the old days, but uh, I can I can really feel it gives me uh, it gives my thought a freshness. You know, I'm, I'm refreshed when I come back from running. Um, so I think um, uh, physical movement does help. If if you go walking or if you go for a walk or if you go running, that depends on you. But I think that's quite important. We are human beings. We are not made to sit on a uh, on a on a chair uh, the whole day long so i think physical uh some physical exercise is important and the other thing is just simply sleep um i realize that if i don't get enough sleep um i get stressed so i try even if that's difficult with uh two two kids i try to sleep at least uh eight hours and i think talking about sleep that's another big important thing is structure uh, you're bound to get stressed and you to feel pressure and in the end maybe suffer from some mental kind of mental problem um, if you don't live a, a regular structured life you know if you sleep one day just three hours and the next 12 and, and then you go to bed at three o'clock the foot one day and the next day you try to go to bed at at 10 p.m i think your mind will suffer so i think structure is something something very important as well and and just to finish ronnie how can we find out more about um your writing the work you do but but also the foundation and, and the work that that robert's wife is is doing mm -hmm. i think that the work the foundation is doing is mostly in in german obviously because it's germany based and uh, they were trying to establish a link with the the english fa um but i don't think it has come far um prince william actually came over to visit us at the foundation and he seemed very passionate about uh i think for personal reasons um um that's his word actually to normalize um mental health issues so i think you would need to speak german or be able to understand a little bit of german um to to find out more about the foundation but from what i learned i think there's are some great initiatives in in British football as well, mainly by Prince William, who is, I think, uh, was a chairman of the English FA. 
but also by sportsmen like Danny Rose, who suffered, uh, the Tottenham Hotspur player, who suffered himself from depression and speaks very openly about it. Uh, Terry Henry, another great Arsenal striker, who's engaged on that side. So I think many things have moved forward in England or in Great Britain as well, uh, particularly after the sad death of uh, Gary Speed, the former Wales, Wales uh, international. Yeah, and I think yeah, there's a few other footballers in, in the UK that are doing uh, similar things. I think Andros Townsend, who plays for, for Crystal Palace, has done similar mm-hmm. stuff. Um, and actually, uh, there's a there's a programme in England called Heads Together, and, and they did a lot of work in football, and, and they had... Um, Gareth Southgate and Prince William and um, and a few of the the men's and women's football for England national team um, has spoke about it. So I think that that landscape is definitely is definitely yeah. shifting, which is really good. Yeah, and I think it's important because, um, as you mentioned it earlier, um, sportsmen are seen for some reason as mentally strong, and if they explain to to people that even they are in danger of suffering from uh, depression, uh, people realize, aha, it's not something which is just happening to weak people. No, it's something happening um, to everybody, no matter how strong you are, like a crucial ligament injury can happen to everybody. And I think that's important to stress that point all the time. And I think sportsmen can do and do help a lot in this case. Just the kind of final point that's been been really encouraged in the UK and actually our the the younger players that we've got are taking on uh, on issues that they really care about and and they seem to have a much greater freedom to speak passionately about you know whether it's Marcus Rashford and um, and childhood um, uh, food poverty or um, Jaden Sancho and Raheem Sterling speaking about racism the, this generation of footballers I don't know it's the same in Germany but in England especially, have kind of been been freed up to talk about issues that they're passionate about and, and actually make um, and make social change. Jordan Henderson as well as another one, and that's been really positive to see. Yeah, I think that's um, at least something we can uh, praise society on. I think this young generation is encouraged to, to speak about uh, difficult things in life and uh, we have problems in life much more than, than we were maybe 20, 30 years ago uh, when society was still trying to pretend everything is fine that uh, you know even as an individual you were always taught that um, you don't sh- show um, w- when you're injured um, you don't sh- show when you're hurt you know you're trying to to pretend uh, that you're a strong man by not showing and that's obviously completely wrong um, you solve problems by facing problems and not by cheering over them we have a saying in in the UK, which is, you know, having a stiff upper lip and, and that's all about just kind of battling through things and not recognising them and just, you know, just getting through them and, and not recognising the, the trauma that it may have caused. Um, but I think that's a that's a really nice place to leave it, Ronnie. Thank you so much for your time. And, and, and like I said, you, you wrote very compassionately and knowledgeably and, and accessibly about about Robert's story and about about mental health generally in the book. Thank you very much, Harold. That's uh, I'm happy you can't see how I'm blushing now. And uh, no, it was very <laughs> it was very nice talking to you indeed. Uh, your your question were very uh, they helped me to talk a lot, and uh, I could see that you were well prepared for that. Thanks a lot. Hi everyone. I really hope you enjoyed that episode. Just a quick note to say, that although the things I discussed with the guest we may find helpful, I'm not a trained medical professional. If you're struggling with your mental health, please contact your GP or speak to an organisation like Samaritans on 116 123.